How's everybody doing? Good. I, uh, I have something that I want to share with you guys today, and it is either a fresh revelation from God, false, or so simple everybody realized it but me, okay? I hope it's one of those. Um, I think one of the, the ways in which people get most confused is in any job that you have, in any role that you have, there's uh, defined roles, and there's, there's what you're doing, and then there's what this other person is doing um, at work, and you try to stick to your role because oftentimes the role of the other person depends on you doing what you're supposed to do. Are you guys following me? And how many of you guys know that the scripture is filled with a defined role that you have and what God has? If you try to do what God is, is doing and not what you're supposed to be doing, you're going to be very frustrated. Because you could spend your whole life doing what it is God was supposed to do, not doing what you were supposed to do, wondering why God never did it. Follow me? I call this principle just the defined role principle, so I'm going to just write it up there. If I drop, it's from the thickness of this marker, <laughs> not the Holy Ghost. I could. Anyway. I'll be okay. Well, we're going to definitely cap it. Um, how many of you guys would like to, for God to make your paths straight? So his role is to make your path straight. But then what's your role? What'd you say? Well, that's a canned answer. But the, the verse here <laughs> says, in all your ways acknowledge him. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. But if you try to make your path straight, instead of acknowledging him, you're going to be kind of frustrated. How many of you would like plenty of finances? Three of you. <laughs> Everybody, like some of you guys just went from uh, eyeball to eyeball with the corners of your cheeks. You're like, <laughs> you make me laugh. So then honor the Lord from your wealth. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow. How many of you would like to find favor with God and with man? Do not let kindness and truth leave you. And now there, you're going to have to struggle and wrestle with Holy Spirit as he teaches you what those things mean, right? But there's your role and then there's God's role. I, I, I look at this and this is the question we're going to be wrestling with today. And it's a good question to wrestle with. Who is responsible for growing your faith? And it's a very interesting question. And I just did a word study of the word faith throughout the whole New Testament. And I came to just a radical conclusion. Okay? How many of you guys have like um, someone you look up to? Like in the, in the spiritual sense. Right? Typically, this person has had a, a few spiritual experiences, right? And there's something about encountering God that ends up changing us, okay? How many of you, if you could be in charge of encountering God, would want me to hurry up and be done so you can go encounter him? If there was an encounter button at your home, right, that you could just press, you could wake up and be like, during my prayer time, I think I'll encounter God, and hit the encounter God button. You'd hit the button. Would you do it every morning? I would too. But I don't have one, right? I'm actually dependent on God. See, if there's something on my end to do, I want to do it. If there's something on my end that says, hey, Adam, if you do this, then you'll encounter me, then I want to do what's on my end. But I can't make him show up and encounter him. Do you guys understand that? And if somebody out there is like, oh, this guy doesn't know about this verse, I encounter God every morning. Come talk to me and tell me what that verse is and how you do that, because I would like to do that too. But I can't make God encounter me, but there is something that I can do that the Bible talks about. Let me just read you a few other verses. Hey, 
How many of you would like all things to work for good in your life? The good and the bad. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. So my role is to love God. To love God, I need to obey his commandments, right? John 14.21 says this, He who has my commandments and keep them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. That disclosing is that encountering. Make known. God will make known to you. How does he make, how does he make himself known to who? To those who, are you guys saying obey his commandments? Is that what you're saying? Because you guys aren't in sync out there. (laughs) It says this, he who has my commandments and keeps them, right? What's his commandment? To love God and love others, right? He says, if you do that, I'll disclose myself to you. Every, I am who I am because of my encountering of God. Now, I didn't make him show up, but he showed up for a specific reason, and we'll get to that. And if I could make him show up more often, I would, but there is something that I can do on my end to help get those encounters going, okay? Now, here's the thing. Uh, Brian's sitting in the front here. Um, Brian had this awesome encounter with God, and it was... um, I think he was, and forgive me, you were either two days before having the twins or two days after having the twins. When you called me and said, this is what he kept saying. He said, I just believe that God knows what I need without asking. And I just believe that God's going to provide a vehicle for Nicole and I, because he was having four kids, right? After the two were born, you had two, then you had two more. And he needed a van. And in the midst of saying, the kids are born and he needs, he needs a van to haul all these kids around. Three days after the kids were born, somebody felt led and bought him a van. So now he has this, if I could just use faith as the capacity to hold something. He went from this to this in his faith. And he encountered God and it caused his faith to grow, which gave him more capacity to hold something. Okay? How many of you want to go from this to this? All right? I know I do. So faith is the conviction of things not seen. Okay? Which means that you're living your life according to something that you believe that nobody else can see. Therefore, you act in a certain way that might not make sense to everybody. Okay? But you believe something in your heart which is causing you to live a certain way, which God says when he sees that it pleases him and that he'll encounter you because of it. If I could just ask you guys, when was your last God encounter that actually changed you? Was it a month ago? Was it six months ago? Was it a year ago? Was it five years ago? How long has it been since you encountered God and it actually changed you? Um, there's a wife that my, that there's my, there was a verse that my wife was holding on to and it was, um, God blesses the barren woman. He makes the, uh, barren woman, the mother of many children, shout for joy. And, and she was holding on to this verse and, um, I mean, it took us forever to have kids, but she got alone with God. She, from her end, began to see this verse, it began to cause her to live a certain way. Disappointment and frustration and anxiety left because she began to stare at the verse instead of the past six years of not having children, right? And then all of a sudden, Brecken comes along because something in her, she was looking at something else besides what was happening. Does this make sense? And then she went from this to this. And if you look back on her life, a a big portion of her faith has to do with what God did in the midst of childbearing for her. And she knows him as a good father in that way. Does that make sense? See, Brian knows him as a provider maybe more than I do. It's part of his faith, and it's part of his faith walk. And so part of his faith and the size of the capacity that he has 
It's because of an experience. Because of um, her, it was an experience. I was, I was baptized in the Holy Ghost. I was promised at the age of 16, God revealed that verse to me that was just read, Acts 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witness. When I was 16, God showed me that verse. And when I was 29, it happened. And I encountered him. And a lot of portion of my faith comes from that encounter. You guys hear what I'm saying? A lot of portion of my faith comes from the identity message when God finally, or the Holy Spirit finally revealed to me what it means to be dead to self, for the old to be gone and the new to be here. But they were experiences. I always had the Bible and what the Bible said. It was always there. But until I encountered God in the scriptures, it didn't become part of my faith. You guys following me? So when it comes to growing this thing called faith, I want to read for you guys something. Ephesians, um, Romans 12, 3 says this, for by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think soberly, each according to the measure of faith that God has appointed. Who gives the faith in this passage? God does, right? He gives each person an allotted amount, amount, and now you could read that and say, okay, so everybody kind of has a different, different starting point, like in the parable of the talents, like one and two and five. But just hold on a second. Each is given a portion of faith. And what happens if you think that you have more faith than you do, then you're going to get pretty frustrated. It's not, it's not this. And I used to think, see it this way. Don't be proud and think you have more faith than you do. If you think you have more faith than you do, you're going to hit a lot of dead ends and you're going to get really frustrated why God isn't moving. Follow me? Hebrews 12.2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith. So are you the author and perfecter of your faith or is Jesus the author and perfecter of your faith? Jesus is, Right? I can't tell you how many times I've I've heard people say, well, you just need to grow your faith. But I can't grow my faith. But there is something I can do, and I will tell you that in just a second. First Corinthians 3, 7 and 8. Chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. So God is causing the growth, and God causes the growth through the encounter. Okay? But now watch this. Then what am I doing? Am I saying just, you know, just sit there and God will just cause you to grow after a while? That's not what I'm saying. Your job is to steward the faith that you have. That's it. Your job is to simply take the faith that you have, steward it well, and then if you steward it well, God will give you more of it. But you can't grow your faith but you can steward the faith that you do have. So I could say this, well, how how do you grow grow in faith? We might say, well, we we read the Bible, we we read scripture, we, 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 we pray, and we do these disciplines. That stuff's good. It's important. But there's something that you're supposed to be stewarding more so than just knowledge, right? This 300% blew me away. Are you guys ready for this? I'm going to go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant of the apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of God our Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So grace and peace actually get multiplied in the knowledge of God. Okay, these are just facts for them. This isn't just like a... How can I really sound holy here as I greet this church? Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. How many of you want more grace and peace in your life? Which means that you need to have more knowledge of God. How do you have more knowledge of God? Can you read scripture? Absolutely. But it's when the scripture comes to life through the encounter of God, do you actually have the knowledge or the intimacy with God? You guys follow on me? So watch this. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Okay. His, here's, here's everything pertaining to life and godliness that was given to him by his divine power. 
okay? It's all there. Is that a cool? You guys excited about that? Everything pertaining to life and godliness, he has granted to you. But what is everything pertaining to life and godliness? It'll tell us here in a second. Through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. Are you guys ready for this? Everything that I told you about those experiences were based on a promise off scripture. How do you form a relationship with somebody? Well, you listen to what they say and then you watch them follow through. You listen to what they say, you believe in what they say, and then you watch them follow through. Does God want to follow through on all of his promises? Absolutely. Absolutely. Are you going to be a different person next year if you continue to endure and be in relationship and steward the faith that you have? Do you think God wants to encounter you again? See, here's, here's my question. I find it fascinating. You have all these people, right? Let's say Brian's up here and he's talking and he's, he's tearing it up. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And he says, if you, for those of you who want to receive the Holy Spirit, Right? I want you to come up here. We're going to lay hands on you. He goes and he lays hands, and some person is like, goo, 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 and, right? and they're on the ground, and they're shaking, and God's encountering them, and somebody else is like, felt nothing, did nothing. Right? What if, just listen, what if the person who received was stewarding what they had very well, and the person who did not receive just wasn't stewarding everything they had been given, so they weren't ready for more? You guys follow me? I, I really, and this is just kind of like a pet peeve of mine. I, I, really, I really don't like it when people just, all of a sudden somebody preaches and then all of a sudden they're like, all right, now we're going to baptize people in the Holy Spirit and they didn't even teach on it. And all of a sudden now you got people coming up to see what happens if they do come up. It's not about seeing what happens. It's about stewarding everything that you understand God to be well now so that you can be prepared for the more that he has for you. Are you guys following that? So watch this. Somebody says this, I want God to speak to me, yet they don't read their Bible. Do you think that person's ready for God to speak to them? They probably need to store what it is they do have. Because if you don't, even what you do have will be taken away. You might say, how do you know that? Have you guys ever had a uh, conscience before? What happens when you don't listen to it? It doesn't get loud. It doesn't start going, wah, 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 wah. it goes away. If you don't steward your conscience, you lose it. How many of you know that by experience? You bad people. <laughs> How many of you want it back? You think God wants to give it back? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what's going to happen with these precious and magnificent promises? In order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature. Do you know what part of the divine nature is? Not worrying about money. And I don't say that, so therefore don't work and let the government support you. That's not what I'm saying. But I can promise you that Brian probably has a little bit more of the divine nature in that area because of the promise that he read in Scripture and because he had his heart set on it and he fixed his eyes on it and because he encountered God and his faith went from this to this because of an experience based on the promise. You guys following me? In order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption this is in the world by lust. Now, for this very reason, applying all diligence. Now, is God going to apply all diligence, or are you supposed to apply all diligence? You are. That's your defined role, right? You're going to apply all diligence. That word in the Greek means what it says it means. Everything you got, pressing the envelope, pushing as hard as you can, okay? Are you guys ready for this? In your faith. So with all diligence, in your faith, pretend these things are your little faith pockets. And there's three different people up here with these three different amounts, right? Supply moral excellence. 
And in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. So here's the thing. The goal of our instruction is love, but those other aspects are important, right? So if the goal of our instruction is love, I'm going to take the faith that I've been given. I'm going to come over to everything that he's provided. He's provided all this, all this stuff, right, of godliness, like moral excellence, like love, like brotherly kindness, like um, self-control. And I'm going to fill it. But there's only so much I can fill it with. Then I'm going to take this and I'm going to steward it. Steward those seven things. And how do you steward it in the kingdom? You got to give it away. Right? You guys following me? I can't trust a girl to catch it. (laughs) Prove them wrong, Jess. Get ready. Oh, good job. I was was just doing that to have any male chauvinists out there say, that's right, under their breath, so I can reveal them. (laughs) Girls can catch. (laughs) It was from this marker. Now listen to this. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord. What happens in Matthew 25? You got somebody who's got five and two and one, right? The person with one, these five give it all away. They give it all away, right? This person holds on to it. So let me see, let me see two of those. Give me one more. What if there's this... There's this um, and excuse me if I don't have my, my history straight here. I'm going to try to describe Jewish culture to the best of my ability. Um, uh, Rosh Hashanah was the, was the new year for the Jews. And the, you had to have it together by Rosh Hashanah, okay? Because Yom Kippur was coming up in like 10 days. And based on how you were doing is how God was going to deal with you, okay? So by the new year, you wanted to get it straight to finish out the year well. And if you didn't finish out the year well, you had 10 days to get it really straight. And if you couldn't get it straight for those 10 days, then it wasn't going to go well for you. You might say, that's, that's funny. It's, it's, it's funny, but it's not because we don't know what encounters we're missing because of how we're stewarding what it is we've been given. Does that make sense? So what, okay, let's just say, instead of me with all diligence, with, with love and brotherly kindness and, and self-control and knowledge and moral excellence, instead of me pressing the envelope and giving everything God gave me away, I hold on to it. And God's coming to encounter me because he wants to give me more faith so I could be more like him, more like the divine nature, escaping more of the corruption of this world, right? And he comes around and this is what he sees. Now, as a good father, would you give your child a bigger container when they can't even handle the one they have? Then the encounter is missed. Why? Because we were holding on to the very thing that we were supposed to give away. You guys follow me? But we were, with all diligence, supposed to press this on. Because I, for, for a while, I had the, swol- the uh, roles switched in my head. I thought, felt like if I grew my faith, then God was going to make me love people better. But that's not the role. I'm supposed to love people to the degree that I can. To the degree that I can, which means this. If I could just draw this for you for a second. This is how I used to see it. Here was the best choice you could make, and here was the worst choice you could make, okay? And I felt like that I could just kind of make any choice I wanted to every morning, okay? That I could just wake up and I could just choose the best choice, and I could just love people like Jesus. But what if I can love people to the degree that I have the faith to love people? What if I don't feel convicted because I'm not taking care of orphans in Africa, but there's a place to actually have the conviction to do that, but my faith isn't there yet? I'll show you this in a second. So what if I'm responsible for whatever area I'm in, whatever rung of the ladder, let's just say I'm here, to make sure that I'm pressing upwards and giving away 
all that I can so that when God does come with an encounter, that I might know him more. And then all of a sudden I have access to be more like him. Do you have access now? You might say, well, yeah. Well, then you should probably be pretty frustrated with yourself with how much of him you are producing. But I wonder if you could steward right now what it is you have been given. Do you guys see the difference? How many of you ever get frustrated because you're not loving people as much as you'd like to? But what if you loved people to the degree that you could currently? Don't you think in time? What if you did the best you can with all you can for as long as you can that God would come and then grant you more because you're ready. Do you guys see the difference? I want to know what my faith is so that I can live according to it and so that I can steward it well so I could get more of it. That's a great question. I would need a conscience for that because I bet you my conscience is to convict me of whatever line I'm at. I bet you... If I live less than that, I bet you my conscience is going to kick in. If I, I bet you condemnation is living above what it is you're capable of living. What if that was actually condemnation? Everybody says condemnation is something when you do something wrong. Well, don't feel condemned. You probably don't feel condemned. Condemnation comes when you're trying to do something that you can't do. What 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 if that's just your conscience telling you, hey, you could have done it. And you could have chose right. And we listen to that. Okay. In Matthew 10, 39, I'm going to call this the second principle. Giving is receiving. Matthew 10, 39. He who has found his life shall lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake shall find it. Okay? Whatever we're willing to give away, we actually get. Whatever we try to hold on to, we actually lose. So what happens in the parable of the talents? You have have this guy here. He's got one. This guy has two. This guy has five, right? I don't think it was about making the money as much as it was trying. You know what I mean? Like, what if this guy said, hey, I did try to invest your money. I tried to invest your money. And I lost it. I don't think he'd be angry. I think he's angry the fact that he didn't give it away. So it remained. These guys invested it and made more. And what ends up happening with the guy who lost it is it doesn't go well for him. So here's the tricky thing. Have you guys ever known somebody who's changed over time? What they were capable of doing, they were no longer capable of. What was so easy for them to do is no longer easy for them to do. What I mean like this, let's say... um, You have this person, and they're going to church and stuff, and and everything's going well, and they're making good decisions, and they start backing up and starting back away, and what was so easy for them to do, like overlook the imperfections of other people, is now not as easy for them to do. The grace for it's almost gone. Or how easy it was for them to come to church and now they don't. It's actually hard for them to come to church. It was a joy, but now it's hard. Well, if I just give some of this stuff away and I refuse to give away what I've been freely given, I wonder if God wouldn't just say, okay, apparently you can't have this much and you can't handle it. So, here. Try to do that to the best of your ability. If you can't handle this, why don't you just try to handle this to the best of your ability? And we'll see how you do. 
which, which just brings so many things to question. It's like, our standard, our standard for how somebody should be living is now blown to part based on how much faith they have. Does that make sense? So it's very hard for me to judge somebody. Now, there, there's standard things that aren't wrong. Like if someone's, um, you know, uh, beating up somebody in the parking lot, I'm not going to say to you, now, hold on, you don't know how much faith they have, okay? <laughs> Just let them work that out. What I mean is this, is that we should have lots of grace and mercy for people because what's easy for us might not be easy for somebody else. And because you encountered God in a certain area, that doesn't mean that everybody else did. And you should have grace and mercy and a testimony on your lips about his goodness, not about where they should be by now. And heaven forbid they're slipping down because with all diligence, we're supposed to be applying all these things and increasing. You guys following me so far? John 12, 24 through 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. So there's, there's another one that I want to share with you guys. It's number three. And it's just a perseverance principle. Let me read you what it says about perseverance. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not grow tired of doing good, for in due time we shall reap a harvest if we do not give up. So I've got this. I'm giving this away, giving it away, giving it away, giving away love, brotherly kindness, giving away all that stuff. And in due time, the master will come and see how I've been handling the faith I've been giving, and he will portion out more. Does that make sense? Hebrews 10, 34 through 36. Starting in verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. The entire book of Revelations 2 and 3 talks about nothing but enduring till the end. And John 8, 31 through 32, for Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. So there's a, a if I could just draw this. If you're sitting on the side, you're losing out. There's chronos, which is the Greek word for time. It's just the, the idea of time, synchronized time, moving forward, right? Then there's the idea of aeon, which is a span of time in time. Then there's the idea of a kairos, which is a, a moment within that span. When I read the verse Galatians 6, this is what it says. Let us not grow tired of doing good, for in Kairos we shall reap a harvest if we do not get up, give up. So there's a, a Kairos moment that takes place in which if we're persevering and pressing on and giving away what it is we've been given, there's going to come a moment in which we reap a harvest. So how do you grow your faith? Well, you don't. You steward what you are able to fit into your faith the best you can, and you give it away. You give as much of it away as you possibly can. And ever since I started seeing things this way, I've been so aware of those seven things in my life. Just so aware. Because I'm, I'm going to go into a lot more of it next week. But if I just believe God's kind of encountering whoever wants to encounter whenever he does, and there's really nothing on my end to participate in, guess what I'm going to be doing? Nothing. Nothing. I'm just going to lose the faith that I had been freely given. It's just going to go away eventually. But if I realize that I've actually been given something, how much, how much love do you have? I, I, don't, I don't know. Let's just, let's just say this, right? Um, here's a scenario. It's an awful scenario, so I apologize. Um, you come home and you find your, your spouse cheating on you, Okay? One person comes home 
and is able not to um, beat them up, is able to, to hold back physical violence. And for them, it's a big deal. You guys following me? For them, not, not getting involved and, and, and literally physically getting violent is them pressing their limits to the test. And they're literally doing everything they can with all the self-control they have to not hit somebody. You have another person who comes home who, who is able to um, remain calm and wants to give, get help for that couple, for that, for that person and, and their spouse, and they want to work it out. They're angry, they're, they're frustrated, but they're at least willing to stay in. That's how much love they have, that they're at least willing to stay in. And somebody else walks in and sees that and literally weeps for their spouse because they must not know who God is. You guys see what I'm saying? And this person doesn't make it about them. It makes it about the spouse who's in trouble and, and uh, they must not know God and they're, they're literally in danger and, and they're making it about them, not themselves. Now, are... are should these two aim to get here? Absolutely. We should all aim to get to a place of absolute love. Is it possible to be like Christ? Yes, it is. But I bet you it's a harvest in which you sow and reap, sow and reap, and sow and reap. And for anybody in here who's tired of not being like Jesus, I bet you if you be the best that you've been given for as long as you possibly can be, I bet you you'll get even closer than you ever have been before. Do you guys understand that? And there's something, there's something in this that is just so sobering and so exciting when I don't have to be like so-and-so, I just have to be like me to the best that I can be for as long as I can be. That should inspire you. But next week, I really want to get into the pra practicality of this. I'm going to have Brian go get his swimsuit on. He's going to be baptizing people in a second. This last principle I'm going to bring up because I just want to just bring it up. I call it the Superman principle. Do you know that Superman had one weakness? Does anybody know what it was? He had two. He was terrible, terrible at disguising himself and it was kryptonite, right? When I see people doing this, and I've seen a lot of people do this, slide down this scale, and what was easy for them to do at one point, it feels impossible to do now. They had this mentality that they were invincible. They had this mentality that they were the hero of their own story. And, like, and, 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 I, and I, I learned this a long time ago, and hopefully I never let it go. I am not the hero of my story. The things that I have in my life are because of him and they were gifts and thank God. The only thing I did was steward, if I have anything, is steward what I was given, right? Do you know how many warnings are in the Bible towards us? Superman got one. We get about 100 warnings in the Bible about false teachers, about false doctrine, about false prophets, about sin that easily entangles. There are so many warnings in the Bible. We must be a pretty fragile people. Now, I know we don't like viewing ourselves that way sometimes. We can be invincible with the Holy Spirit, but we need to be careful because of how many warnings are in the Bible. And people say this, they say, well, that's just not, that's just not me. That's, you know, that's, that's not going to happen to me. I'm the hero of my story. And it's like, I've seen it happen to the best of them. You know who I've seen it happen to? A lot. Those who got excited right away, who didn't build a root system, and they just withered up right away. The ones who are the most excited some, sometimes are the ones who immediately go away. It disturbs me. So Superman just had to watch out for kryptonite. There's a lot of warnings in the Bible, and we need to heed what they say because they're in there because he loves us. Not to tell us how weak we are, but he wants us to be very careful. And I just want to give this warning about false doctrine and false teachers. 
If what I'm saying is true, it's because I believe the false teacher and false doctrine before. If I believe that I could grow my faith and I did a word study on faith and nowhere in the Bible does it say I can, it only says I can receive and steward what it is I've been given, that means somebody taught that which kept me from with all diligence giving away everything that God had for me because I was waiting for him to do my job and I was trying to do his. You guys following it? I was so busy trying to grow my faith instead of stewarding those seven things and giving them away, having that be my main focus, that I wasn't getting more or wasn't ready to receive more because I was busy trying to do his job. I have a job to do. It's to be obedient so that he'll disclose himself to me, to love people because the goal of our instruction is love. If there's something I can do, then I need to do it. How many of you guys know that I'm not convicted to, to love every single person in your county? That conviction just isn't in me. But there are some people that are in my path that I can love. And I don't want to lose it. If I can be honest with you, there, there was a time where, where I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't walk by somebody who needed prayer. And then because I didn't continue in that, then you lose it. How many of you had, ever had a, a conviction of public ministry? And then you lost it because you didn't continue in it. But I bet you can get it back. So do whatever you can, as good as you can, for as long as you can. And I bet you God will encounter you and I bet you your faith will grow. Does that make sense? It's amazing. If that makes sense to you guys, that's amazing because I've been working on this thing for like two weeks. And I'm still trying, I'm still trying to grab it and, and, and go into what that means. Next week, I'm going to go into the seven things and what that actually means, okay? And, and how do we actually give that stuff away and what does that practically look like? If it's true that we're supposed to be stewarding something, we want to have, with all diligence, make sure that we are stewarding it well so that we can encounter him and that we could grow in faith, that we could put on more of the divine nature and let go of more and escape the corruption of this world. Amen? Do me a favor. Read 2 Peter chapter 1 for yourself, slowly, very slowly, and let the Holy Spirit read it to you, and have an encounter with that scripture, and really, really take your time with it. I'm going to pray for you guys, and then I'm going to have, uh, we're going to have some people get baptized today. That's why we're ending a little bit early today. Are you guys okay? All right. So Father, we thank you. You are such a good dad. Thank you for giving us what we can currently handle. God, and help us to see how we can give it away. Let us be led by the Holy Spirit and let us love people to the best of our ability. We praise you and thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm gonna turn the service over to Brian as, as we get ready to baptize him.